This is our last study going through this brief letter penned by the Apostle John. We have spent 16 weeks going through this uh, letter together, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, and we come to the fifth chapter. And beginning at verse 18 through verse 21, in these four short verses, we're going to see the phrase, we know. We know. And frequently we go through life thinking that we know something. Yeah, I know, whatever. And then there are certain issues in our life that are so important that we need to step back for a moment and just think, do I really know this? I mean, as a, a dad, you, you want to know that you've done the best that you could for your kids. You, you want your kids to know that you love them. You want to know that they love you. You want to know as a follower of Christ, that your children are walking in his ways. There's so many things that we say, I know, but there's so many important life issues where we stop to reflect. And we really want to know. There's, there's a, a sense on Father's Day that these weighty issues, that they mean more than the food or the fun that we might partake in this afternoon. They mean maybe even more than the cards or the gifts. There's a weight to knowing that people that you love and care about are going to spend eternity with you in heaven. And there's a certain comfort with that knowledge. As John talks to us about eternal life, he wants us to know that we have life with God. He wants us to know that we have a relationship with God. And John, as he is frequently throughout this letter, comments to the readers. He refers to them as little children. John is now the last of the apostles. He's in his 90s. He's in the winter of his life. And, and as he looks at followers of Christ generally, as well as those that he had personally interacted with, he just senses that they're his kids. But first and foremost, he's reminding them that they are God's kids. That they're his little children. And it is so important for us to have that comfort of knowing whose we are. And so I want to encourage you, if you're able, if you'll stand with me, we're in 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to read beginning at verse 18, and I'm going to ask you to follow along silently through the end of this letter at verse 21 as we honor the Word of God and the God of the Word. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one who does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true in his Son, we, who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. And eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Let's pray. Father, uh, today would you help us to see that there is truth about God. And in understanding this truth as you by your spirit move in our hearts. Help us to receive this truth. Lord, help it to shape how we think. Help us to shape how we live. Help us to be shaped by this truth and to reject false about God. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So what we're talking about today is the truth about God. We're going to talk about the truth about God. And really the object that I think that God intends for us is that we would receive the truth. We receive it in our minds, in our hearts, that we would receive it as the truth and therefore we would reject the false. We'd reject the false. So as John is telling us this we know, he wants us to know that we have eternal life. And the way that we can know that we have eternal life, John's going to show us that we have transformed relationships. And there's three relationships that he focuses on. And this transformation in these relationships is how we know that we have life with God. Uh, first, we have a changed relationship with sin. Look with me at verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. 
So this idea of born of God is the idea that you've experienced a spiritual birth. When you receive Christ as Savior and, and you submit to him as Lord, you are born of the Spirit. You have a spiritual birth so that now you are born of God or you are a child of God. We are all God's offspring in the sense that we are created by God, but only those who have received Christ are children of God. Those who are born of God... They have a changed relationship with sin because they have a changed relationship with God so that they do not sin. Earlier in this letter, John has said in the second chapter, if you say that you have no sin, you make God a liar because all of us have missed God's mark. All of us miss God's standard of perfection. Either we might not know all the commandments or we might have an attitude that is off or we might by our actions not do what uh, we're supposed to do, or we do what we're not supposed to do. So each of us has to come to God recognizing that we are sinners. But once we receive Christ, then our life is to be transformed so that we start to make progress and we start to experience victory over sin. And John has referred to this idea that we don't sin five times now. It's a theme he keeps coming back to. He wants us to understand that the way that we really know that we have a relationship with God is that we see progress in our sanctification, our experience of sanctification, and the idea that we are submitted to God's commands. And so the Gnostic philosophers that John was refuting, these false teachers, they had this philosophy that said, because the body is always going to be evil and the spirit is always going to be good, it doesn't matter what sin you commit because the spirit will always be good. In other words, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas and it doesn't impact your relationship with God. And that was like a super attractive philosophy because our flesh likes the idea that we could sin all we want and still have an intimate, close, healthy relationship with God. It sounds attractive, but it's completely contrary to the Bible. A true child of God is going to experience victory over sin. And so each and every one of us here has different things that we struggle with. Um, it's easy for us to default to the ideas of alcohol, drugs, sexual sin. Those just easily come to mind, especially in the context of church culture. But when you start to think about this experience, you say, well, you know, I've got victory over this area in my life. And that's good. I, I rejoice. But as this process continues to unfold, I assume you all would appreciate with me that none of us has graduated yet. Right? And until we go to be with Jesus or he comes to gather us, there's areas in our life that he wants to work where we are no longer outside of his will, but we are submitted to his will. We think about areas of lying, pride, jealousy, coveting, greed, apathy towards God. And how are we growing in these areas? When I, I first came to Christ, I, I, I'm not proud of, of this, but I confess it. Um, I used profanity like some people would use salt and pepper. It just flowed out of my mouth. I wasn't conscious of it. And as I had come to Christ during the first month of, of becoming a follower of Christ, my language had changed. And it wasn't like I was consciously thinking, well, uh, you know, I'm a Christian now. I shouldn't be using language like this. God was just transforming my heart. The next thing that I, I discovered, and it was really kind of awkward, it was a time when I was practicing law, and in the middle of a case that took place over several months, uh, one person on the other side, and the other party of this case, uh, the first time we had this encounter, I was a pre-Christian. The second time we had this encounter, I was a follower of Christ. And they said these words to me, you must have had a, a really bad day last time because you were mean, but now you're nice. And I thought, oh, this is horrible. This is bad for my profession, you know. It's like, I'm becoming all loving. Uh, it's the last thing I wanted to do, you know. And again, it wasn't something I was consciously trying to do, but God was moving in my heart. There was this transformation taking place. Uh, relatively recently, I um, just came to the realization in uh, contemplating the greatest commandment that we love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, 
that not only did I not love my neighbors as I love myself, I didn't even love my neighbor. And <laughs> I read that, and it was just conviction of the Holy Spirit that I, I had to change that because it was this commandment. It wasn't a commandment that I was supposed to just read and say, oh, yeah, whatever. The God was saying, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I was either going to change my heart and my actions towards my neighbor or I was going to rebel against them. And I don't know what's been going on in your life, but I want to encourage you that if you can look and you see that God has been working right, to give you victory over sin, areas in your life that aren't in conformity to God's word, areas in your life where the Holy Spirit is nudging you, stop doing this, start doing that, and you can look and experience progress, victory, rejoice, because it's evidence that you have a changed relationship with God. And if you're sitting here today and you're thinking like, well, I don't have any sin, we call that pride, okay? So we can just start right there with that one. Um, and so you want to be able to look and see areas where you're growing, areas where you're making progress, because it is evidence of God's work in your life, that transformed relationship with him. Uh, second area in terms of a transformed relationship, is a changed relationship with the wicked one and the world. Uh, here we see that Jesus' followers are not controlled by the wicked one. That's where we start at verse 18. He who has been born of God keeps him, and the wicked one does not touch him. And so John wants to encourage followers of Christ, believers, that uh, they are no longer subject to Satan's control, that, that Satan and any demonic influence can no longer attach itself to you. As uh, John is writing this letter in the fourth chapter, he said to us at verse 4, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We don't see any indication anywhere in the New Testament of a believer, a follower of Christ, uh, experiencing demonic uh, possession. And yet we do see that Satan exercises influence in the world that we are in. Uh, we see that Satan's influence is subject to God's sovereignty. Satan is not an equal with God. He is a created angelic being who led a rebellion, taking one third of the angelic beings with him in this rebellion against God. But he is not God. So we see in the life of Job, in Job chapters 1 and 2, we see in the life of Peter, described in Luke 22, that Satan's influence is limited by God's authority. And so what Satan wants to do is once you come to faith in Christ, Satan can no longer uh, exercise control over your soul. So what he wants to do is to now tempt you, distract you away from God, or distract you so that you're not living on mission to advance God's kingdom. You're not living on mission to advance the gospel, but in essence, you're living for this world. And so as you experience this transforming work with God, what you discover is that Satan is no longer controlling your life, controlling this influence of your life, so that now you are free to worship God. You know that you have been freed from Satan's influence and control because you now experience this freedom, this desire to worship God. Not simply as you gather with other believers to learn the Bible, to sing songs of praise, to pray, to experience the dynamic of corporate worship together, but outside of the church, in other words, the assembly on weekends, outside you have this heart to worship God. He has become the master passion of your life so that you know you've broken the control of the enemy of men's souls. But not only are we free from the control of the wicked one, we are free from the control of the world. Jesus' followers are not controlled by the wicked one or the world. We see at verse 19, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So the Bible explains to us that when Adam and Eve rebel against God in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, that as a consequence of that, the unintended consequence is that now Satan exercises influence in our world until Christ returns. At the first coming, uh, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross 
provided the means to break control of the wicked one over our lives. But he is still influencing this world system. And so when John uses the term world here, we've previously talked about this, that he's not talking about the planet. He's not talking about the creation. He's talking about a world system that the values and the philosophy are contrary to God. As you think about the culture that we live in, and some of the respects that it's contrary to God. For example, the idea that there are many roads that lead to God, that all faiths lead to God, that as long as you're sincere and you don't look to hurt someone, then you'll be right with God. That eternal life is for everyone. No one experiences any judgment from God. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die, is a philosophy of the world. YOLO, you only live once, is a philosophy of the world. Atheism, materialism, the idea of any type of philosophy or value that is contrary to God is characteristic of the world. And what John is saying to us is that who is at the essence of this ultimately, it's Satan's influence to keep us from God. And so you start to think about your values and you start to think about the philosophy that guides your life, the, the compass that guides your life. And it's either coming from the word of God or it's coming from the culture around you. And so the culture around you is trying to squeeze you into its mold. When our kids were small, there was this thing called the Play-Doh Pumper. I'm not a big fan of Play-Doh, especially on my carpet. But the Play-Doh Pumper, man, you could put this can of Play-Doh, this big blob, and you just squeeze the handle and out comes perfect circles and squares and stars and rectangles and trapezoids. I don't even know what a trapezoid is, really. Um, but you just pull that hand. I, I know somebody's going to come up to me after the service. Pastor Bruce, here's a trapezoid right here. It's like, no, really. I didn't need to know, thanks. Um, and so that's what the world's trying to do. It's trying to squeeze you into this mold. You are this round peg in Christ. And it's trying to squeeze you into this square hold, the square mold. And there's this pressure here. You start to think about uh, the world's values and the world that we live in. So the culture that we live in says that safe sex doesn't hurt anyone. A and so there's nothing wrong. Uh, the Bible helps us to understand that God has set marriage a as that place where we experience true intimacy. And that intimacy is not only physical intimacy, but there's this underpinning of spiritual intimacy and emotional intimacy that therefore you can experience physical intimacy in all three of these areas in marriage. And what we don't understand is that sex outside of marriage is actually an obstacle to experiencing true intimacy. And so if we get our value from the world that says, well, it's not hurting someone, but we don't actually understand that it is hurting. The betrayal, the heartache, the callousness that develops towards our emotions, towards other people that we should experience intimacy with as God designed. We start to think about the issue of reproductive rights, the issue of a woman's choice. Lord. And we need to also appreciate that God has said that life is sacred, the sanctity of life. That that is not a choice. That is a living being that God has fashioned, that God knew even before that child was conceived. That is a soul. Similarly, on the other end of the spectrum, the idea of euthanasia or assisted suicide or any suicide. And to understand that there's times where human beings are in incredible hopelessness, incredible pain, incredible suffering, and they want to end it. And the idea of looking and saying that that decision isn't yours to take your life because God has created your life and your life is set apart to God and your life has value to God and you are understanding the sanctity, this holiness of life. And so in saying this, it's not that I'm insensitive at all to the reality that there are people that I'm speaking to who have experienced sexual sin, including myself. There are people in this room who have contemplated abortion, perhaps gone 
through that experience who have thought about suicide. One out of every eight high school students will have contemplated suicide before their senior graduation. So it's not that I'm insensitive or unaware. What I'm trying to say to you is how we respond to the cultural values. We, we either say, well, you know, everybody in the culture is doing this, so it's got to be okay. Or we look and we say, no, it, it's not okay. And, and because God says it's not okay, and there is a better way, there is hope, and there's a better way. And so where are you getting your values from? What, as you process life in terms of philosophy, where your values come in conflict with God's values, you're either saying, like, God, you, you really missed it on this one, or you recognize that he's right and you're wrong. So not only is there the sense that you overcome the, the world in terms of the philosophy and the values, the, the thinking, it, there's also this love of the world. The, the fact that we look to this world, our experiences in this world should bring pleasure, should bring enjoyment, especially when you live in a place that's called the Pleasant Valley. I mean, uh, we have two seasons, early summer, late summer. Um, Every day is fun, you know? Like, it, there was a, about a tenth of an inch of moisture this morning, and Californians are like, oh my gosh, I can't go outside, it's wet. <laughs> yeah. So there should be an experience of, of pleasure, but if we're looking to this world to be that ultimate source of satisfaction and contentment, it's an obstacle because that keeps us From God. That's why John wrote, and we read earlier in this letter, don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Once we overcome the wicked one, once we overcome the world, we are free to worship God. Uh, This is why Jesus said, if my words abide in you, you are my disciples indeed. And you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Set us free from that gravitational pull of this world to be free to worship God, to be free to focus on the life which is to come, rather than focusing on this life as our source of contentment and satisfaction because, guys, everything that we're putting our our hope in apart from Jesus is going to be taken from us. Your relationship with your parents ultimately is going to be taken. Your relationship with your spouse ultimately going to be taken. Even your children and certainly your friends and definitely your things And if that's your ultimate source of contentment and satisfaction, you're going to experience an incredible void inside of you. Um, Many of us live very comfortably, and yet we realize that that place where we live, although it provides comfort, it never satisfies. Uh, Our family, we are experiencing our third slab leak, in other words, broken pipes, in the last three years. This is our second one in the last six months. And everything nice is, like, not so nice right now. It doesn't satisfy. You get that brand new car, and it's got that new car smell, and like, this is awesome! And you tell your little ones, like, we are never going through a drive through again. And then they wear you down. <laughs> week after week, golden arch after golden arch, they just work in you, man. And fine, you relent, and there you are, ordering up the happy meals. Fine, be happy. And, and you're thinking like, well, you know, the aroma of those french fries isn't really that bad. <laughs> and then you go around a corner too fast. <laughs> and the little one says, uh-oh. And everything is changing in your world. Things don't satisfy. This is why we need to change our our thinking uh, about our relationship with the world and our relationship with God. And we need to, to understand that we need to 
surrender our embrace of this world so that we can receive the loving embrace of God. Paul wrote to the Romans and he said, I, I, therefore, in other words, because of everything he'd been explaining to us about the gospel in the first 11 chapters of Romans, he starts the 12th chapter and says, therefore, I, I beseech you, I beg you, by the tender mercies of God, God loves you so much, he's saying, and I'm begging you in light of everything that God has done, that you yield your life to him, which is your reasonable service. He says, yielding your life to Jesus, yielding your life to God, in light of all that God has done and the love that God has shown you in, in dealing with sin and helping you to overcome the world, it's only reasonable for us to want to yield our life to God. And then Paul continues, says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't let this world push you through the Plato pumper but instead be transformed. In other words, all the thinking of the culture around that, that is off base and out of line with what God says, you want to take that cable and put it in the right plug. You want to pull it out and, and put it in the right place. You, you want to say, no, I'm not going to think this way about that issue anymore because God has said it's another way, and I believe that God is right, and so I'm going to change my thinking, my attitude. I'm going to change my actions because I want to align with God. And when that is going on in your life, rejoice because you know then that you have life with God because you have a changed relationship with the wicked one and a changed relationship with the world. The third relationship that is the most important that has to be transformed is a changed relationship with God. Verse 20 John says, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. Uh, Jesus reveals the truth about God. Jesus reveals the truth about God. John says, we know that the Son of God, speaking of Jesus, has come. In other words, he's speaking of the incarnation, that here God has come into our world and he's taken on humanity. He never stops being God, but he has taken on humanity. He's become man. He has taken on flesh. And so we read in John's gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then in verse 14 in chapter 1 of John's gospel, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Son, speaking of Jesus. So he came, and we see it there at verse 20, why? To give us an understanding so that we could understand God. I don't know about you guys. Um, when, if I take Jesus out of the equation, it makes it a little more challenging to understand God. When I contemplate everything that Jesus said, all of his words, if I contemplate everything that Jesus did, all of his works, I begin to get a clear picture of the nature of God, the character of God, the will of God. Jesus gathers with his disciples hours before the cross. They're in the upper room, and he's just told them that he's going to be leaving them. I don't know about you, but if, if I'm in that room and Jesus says, yeah, I'm going to be leaving you, uh, I'm not a happy camper at that moment. And so Jesus sees their expressions, and he, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there's many dwelling places, and if I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And since I go, I will return that you can be there with me forever. Comforting words. But then uh, Thomas says, hey, Lord, where are you going and how do you get there? It's like, we don't even know what you're talking about. Where are you going? And how do we get there? And Jesus responds, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And then Philip says, Lord, just show us the Father. It's, it's good enough. Just show us the Father. And Jesus says, have I been with you so long? If you have seen me, You've seen the Father. In other words, if you know me, if you understand me, if you've received me, if you take my word and abide, you will know the Father. Not only does Jesus help give us that understanding of God, but he came so that we could experience relationship with God. Um, look with me, if you would, uh, verse 20. Uh, that we may know him who is true. So, John says that we may know him. So this is the fourth time we've seen this word, know. But here's the thing. In our English translations, there was a subtlety that we may not have experienced in the English translation that's there in the underlying Greek. 
The first three times, the word that was translated no was the Greek word edo. And edo speaks of intellectual knowledge. Now John uses a different word to describe no. He uses the Greek word gnosko. Gnosko speaks of experiential knowledge, right? So if I, I say, um, I know Abraham Lincoln, I might know about him. I might know some things about the Civil War or his presidency, but I did not know Abraham Lincoln. I am not that old. Um, similarly, if I tell you that I know my wife, it's because we have relationship, we have experience, there, there's a sense of, of communion, there's a sense of community between us, there is a sense of intimacy. That's the kind of knowledge, experiential knowledge, that John is speaking of. He started this letter and he said, I'm writing to you so that you can have relationship with us, but truly our relationship is with God. We have communion, intimacy with God. And Jesus is the only one who can offer us that communion because he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. Now, last thought here is that Jesus is the source of eternal life. We see at verse 20, the true God and eternal life. The true God is and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. So Jesus is not merely the Son of God, but he is also God. So he is the true God. He is all the truth about God is embodied in Christ, and he is God. He says he is the true God and eternal life. So the thought of eternal life, first thing I want you to see with me is eternal life does not speak of the duration of your life. Every human being, every person on this planet, each of you, is going to exist eternally. The reason for that is, is that human beings, unlike every other animal on the planet, have a soul. That separates you from every other animal. Um, so as, as much as I love the dogs that I've experienced in life, I, I'm not expecting them to be in heaven with me. And I know where cats are going, and it's definite. No, 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 no. Oh, yes, spare me the emails. It's just a joke, people. It's like, I don't, don't need 20 cat lady emails in my inbox tomorrow. No, no. Because you are a human created in God's image, you have a soul. So you're an eternal being. You're either going to spend eternity in the presence of God or you spend eternity separated from God. But eternal life doesn't start when you leave this world. It starts when you are born of the Spirit. This, this is the mind-blowing thing. John, early in this letter, 1 John chapter 2, verse 25, he said, this is the promise. In other words, of all the promises that the Bible contains from God towards mankind to express his love, his grace, his kindness, his mercy, his goodness. John's saying this is the one. It's the one that's the apex. It's the one that's separate from all the other ones. This is the promise that he has promised. He has promised us eternal life. He's offering us relationship with him. Now, John said in the fifth chapter, verse 13, These things I have written to you that you might know that you have eternal life. In other words, his primary purpose for writing this whole letter is that we would see the characteristics, the traits of followers of God. We'd be able to look at our lives and and consider input from others that we respect, others that know us, and we could say, yes, I'm making progress in this area. Yes, this is manifest in my life. I'm becoming more loving towards others. I'm I'm becoming discerning about doctrine. I recognize uh, the need to love God first and foremost in my life, and I'm trying to do that and other traits that we would say yes that's happening in my life and so that we would know that we have eternal life that God is moving in your life so that you're experiencing life with God now you just think about anything that you can conceive of that would be greater than that and here's the thing sin offers this illusion that it will satisfy and bring contentment. But it's always a lie. The world, similarly, offers the illusion 
that if we live for this world, we'll be truly satisfied and content. And because we buy into the lie, because the enemy of men's souls tends to distract and deceive us, we miss out on ever lasting relationship with God from this day forward. And here's what's so amazing about that. Apart from God, in a sense of eternity with God, in a place where there's no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more decay, no more disease, there is no answer for the human condition. There's no hope to overcome the pain that is part of this life. Every single one of us in this room has had our heart broken. If you're here and your heart hasn't been broken, don't worry, you'll get your turn. <laughs> we've been betrayed. We've been frustrated, disappointed. We have people that we have poured love into, have not responded and returned that love, etc. This is part of the human experience. Putting aside all the difficult circumstances that we encounter. But Paul, Paul writes, and he says, I, I want you to know that the present suffering that we're experiencing can't be compared to the future glory that God has in store for us. Now, just think about this with me for a moment. Uh, we have a, a dog, he's an Italian greyhound, so he's the smallest of that breed, 18 pounds, right? Little dog, 18 pounds. Okay, try to imagine with me a flea on a little dog. Okay, nod your head if you got that. Yeah, okay. All right, so moving up from Italian grounds, the next part in that line are whippets, okay? They kind of look like uh, medium-sized greyhounds. Whippets get up to about 45 pounds, okay? So now it's a little bigger, twice as big. Can you imagine a flea on a whippet? Nod your head if you can. Uh, okay, all right. So then the biggest of the greyhound lines are greyhounds, and they get up to about 65 pounds. Those are the ones that race, and, and they're glorious to behold, it says in Proverbs 30. Now, a 65-pound dog, pretty good-sized dog, so imagine a little flea on a 65-pound dog. I can do that, right? You can do that, right? Okay, now let's think Great Dane. A dog so big that a guy my, my size can put a saddle on it and ride it. <laughs> Right? You're just imagining me in my little jockey silks right now. Yeah. All right. So a big old dog, little flea. Can you imagine it? Yeah, I can imagine that. I've seen a great dame before. I've seen a flea before. Do, do you understand the, the enormity of the difference between a little flea and a great dame? And still you're capable of making that comparison. Paul said... Our fellows, our, our sufferings that we presently experience, compared to the glory that we're going to experience, unhindered Jesus, that it's so incredible what we're about to experience that it can't be compared to the suffering. It's a mind blowing thought. What he is encouraging us is because we have a relationship with God now, that no matter what we're going through, we're not alone. That no matter how much we might feel that I'm not lovable, you are. No matter how much you might feel alone, lonely, discouraged, suffering, you have hope. This is why Paul concludes and he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. He's reminding them with a very tender voice again keep themselves from idols. Now, most of us here don't have a little carved image that we're bowing down to someplace in our home. But here's what idols look like in our culture. Anything or anyone that is the master passion of your life that you look to to be your ultimate source of contentment and satisfaction, whether it's your career, your accomplishments, your spouse, your parents, your kiddos, that new car that doesn't smell like McDonald's yet, your house, whatever it is, if that's the master source of your passion, it's an idol. So Paul says, or John says, keep yourselves from idols so that you can experience eternal life. And I want to give you a chance right now to realize the truth, receive the truth, and reject the false. If I could ask you just to close your eyes and open up your hearts. 
Close your eyes and open up your hearts, if you would, just out of respect for people around you. If you're here today and you understand the gospel that Christ came, not only to reveal God to us so we can understand, but also to take the penalty that we deserve on the cross so that we could be restored in life with God, forgiven and given life, to experience eternal life from this day forward into eternity. And maybe you haven't responded yet to the gospel. In a moment, you're going to have a chance. And maybe um, you look at your life and you think, well, I, I, I did ask Jesus in my heart. But you're not really seeing any transformation in your life dealing with sin. You're not really seeing any transformation in regard to your values and the place and the attraction of this world. And you recognize that you want to experience that transformation. If that's, if that's you here today, I want to ask you just to raise your hand. Uh, don't worry about what anybody else is thinking. Just raise your hand. Amen. Amen. Yeah, if God's just putting it in your heart that he is calling you to himself today, just raise your hand. Let him know. Praise God. God. All right, everybody put their hands down, please. Father, we just thank you that you're moving in our midst. Lord, help us to have a changed relationship with sin. Help us to have a changed relationship with this world because we have a changed relationship with you. And Lord, we pray that this life with you would be the most important master passion of our life and that this world could just fade away. And so, Lord, to everyone who's responding to you right now, we thank you that you hear our cries. Minister to every need in this place, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.